Before we start our presentation, let us pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege to study about life, about the world you've made, about the truths that never fade. As I apply myself to studies, grant me not only focus and seriousness, but also pleasure and happiness, for the road to truth is long and tedious. I need daily strength to be studious, or keep me daily motivated, for in the end, I know my efforts will be rewarded. Amen. I wanna be a billionaire so fucking bad. Buy all of the things I never had Are you scared or even anxious of controlling your money? Do you hate being broke? Let us help you with that. We can help you develop your understanding on finance and effectively use financial skills, including personal financial management. First, let us unlock what is financial literacy. Financial literacy is a core life skill in an increasingly complex world where people need to take charge of their own finances, budget, financial choices, managing risk, saving, credit, and financial transactions. Poor financial decisions can have a long-lasting impact on individuals, their families, and the society caused by a lack of financial literacy. Low levels of financial literacy are associated with lower standards of living, decreased ecological and physical well-being, and greater reliance on government support. However, when put into proper practice, financial literacy can strengthen savings behavior, eliminate maxed-out credit cards, and enhance timely debt. Financial literacy is the ability to make informed judgments and make effective decisions regarding the use and management of money. Hence, teaching financial literacy yields better financial management skills. Hello everyone, I am Stefan Ruiz Dordas and today let us talk about financial planning. What is financial planning? Financial planning is a process of estimating the capital required and determining its competition. It is the process of framing financial policies in relation to procurement, investment, and administration of funds of an enterprise. Meaning, it is a process of how you are going to deal and analyze your money or investment to achieve your goals in the future. So to deeper our understanding about financial planning, let's watch this video together. Many people find financial planning complex and simply choose to put it off. Others may be confused. It's actually pretty simple. Financial planning, simply put, is charting and following a roadmap to get from where you are to where you want to be 10, 15, or 20 years from now. It's like bringing your family for a road trip, your parents, spouse, and of course, the children. You start from getting to know your current financial position. What financial resources or assets do you already have in place? What sort of liabilities do you have? And how much? How's your cash flow position? Is it enough to power your journey? From your financial position, financial ratios can point to areas of attention. Are you saving enough? Are you borrowing too much? Or too little? Are you paying too much bad debt? Next, you want to know what destinations you want to bring your family. Say, sending your children to university, owning properties giving you rental income, or retiring rich in the Bahamas. Write down those goals and put down the timeline and amount needed. A general roadmap can then be planned out, taking into account the distance, time, and resources needed. Next, determine the optimal asset allocation needed to achieve those goals. It has to match risk and return needs and your loss aversion. It's like choosing a car for the journey. Depending if you like to go fast and furious or slow and steady, you may want a Ferrari, a four-wheel drive, 
or something in between. Given your resources, it may not be realistic to reach all the goals in the time that you have initially planned. In that case, you may need to adjust the goals or adjust your finances, like cutting unnecessary expenses, eliminating bad debt, or increasing leverage. On the other hand, if the goals mean so much to you, you may just need to drive a little faster and work a bit harder. As you plan the roadmap, you'll need Plan B or Plan C to deal with contingencies like medical bills, loss of income due to disability, or even death, so that the family can still reach the destination you planned out. And off you go! As all road trips go, they never happen exactly the way you planned. There may be road bumps, obstacles, distractions, maybe even disasters that take you off the path. Along the way, you may need to slow down when there is a hazard ahead and take advantage of opportunities to speed up. When you ultimately arrive at the destination, you'll want to be in a position that your money is now working for you instead of you working for your money. And that's Financial Planning Explained. talks about your current financial situation and steps to improve it in the future. So you are creating, managing, and enhancing your wealth during your daily life. Financial planning provides direction to your goals and dreams in life because it helps you to understand your goals better in terms of why you need these goals to achieve and how they impact other aspects of your life and finances. Lastly, it encourages you to manage inflation. And now, these are the steps and strategies on how to improve your financial planning. There's a misconception that to be good with money, you need a lot of it. Not true. What you need to be good with money is everyday management. Whether you're planning for yourself or for your whole family, there are three basic steps you can take to make the most of your money. One, create a budget. 2. Set savings goals, and 3. Tackle your debts. When put into practice, these steps can have a big impact not only on your monthly budget, but on your overall financial future. One of the first steps to better money management is to create a budget and stick to it. This might sound simple, but you'd be surprised how few people actually do it. You can think of your budget as your guide to reaching your financial and personal goals. If you have trouble covering all your expenses each month, a budget can help you avoid overspending. That's because your budget can help you see and understand exactly where your money is going and whether or not your spending is in line with your personal goals. The next step is to set savings goals. With your budget in place, building your savings will be that much easier because you'll know how much extra money you have each month to allot to your goals. One of the best savings goals to start with is an emergency fund. Building up an emergency fund to help cover unexpected expenses like a sudden medical bill, major home or car repair, or even a job loss can help you avoid going into debt when life throws you a curveball, which it will. Instead of borrowing money to cover these emergencies, you'll already have the money saved up, and this could end up saving you a lot more money in the long run. Start by building up three months' worth of expenses as a goal. Once you've established an emergency fund and are living within your budget, you can then figure out some long-term savings goals. Whether you decide to plan for your retirement, or save for a home improvement, college, or even a well-deserved vacation, you'll be better able to set aside some money and have a timeline for reaching your goals. The third step is to tackle any debts you have. First, as you're working to pay them down, you'll probably want to stop adding to the debts you already have. The less debt you have, the easier it'll be to get out from under it. It could also be helpful to know what your debt is costing you each month. Once you know how much your debt costs, you can create a plan that helps you reduce it and eventually pay it off. The sooner you get started, the more money you can save. It's worth noting that managing your debt and your savings go hand in hand. For instance, if you have a debt with a very high interest rate, it may make sense to focus on paying it down at the same time or even before you build your entire emergency fund. As you make a plan to tackle your debt, Setting target goals can help you stay on track as you actually see and feel the progress you're making. 
These three steps are the basic components of money management, and it's easy to see how they can work together. By keeping a budget, you'll know what you have available to accomplish your savings goals and tackle your debts. Having an emergency fund can help you avoid adding any new debt. And occasionally checking in, reviewing your budget from time to time, can help you set long-term savings goals, like a down payment on a home, as your priorities and circumstances change. Now that you have an understanding of the basics, why not take the next step? Being smarter with your money, learning new tips and techniques, can help you today and down the road. A financial strategy and goals enables you to assess your financial needs and the better resources required to support and meet your objectives and fulfill your organization, overreaching objectives, as well as plan for continued growth to enable business success and sustainability. I hope you have learned what is about financial planning and how to improve your financial planning. That's all. Thank you. What is budgeting? A budget is an estimation of revenue and expenses over a specified future period of time and is usually compiled and re-evaluated on a periodic basis. Budgets can be made for a variety of individual or business needs or just about anything else that makes and spends money. Budgeting, on the other hand, is the process of creating a plan to spend money. Creating this spending plan allows one to determine in advance whether he or she will have enough money to do the things he needs or likes to do. Budgeting ensures to have money for the things needed and for those important ones and will keep one out of death. Here are the 7 steps to good budgeting. Step 1. Set realistic goals. Goals for the money will help make smart spending choices upon deciding on what is important. Step 2. Identify income and expenses. Upon knowing how much is earned each month and where it all goes, start tracking the expenses by recording every single cent. Step 3. Separate needs from wants. Let us set clear priorities and decisions become easier to make by identifying wisely those that are really needed or just wanted. Next, step 4. Let us design our budget. Let us make sure to avoid spending more than what is earned. Balance your budget to accommodate everything needed to be paid for. Step 5. Put your plan into action. Match spending with income time. Decide ahead of time what you will use each payday. Non-reliance to credit for the living expenses will protect one from debt. Step 6. Plan for seasonal expenses. Set money aside to pay for unplanned expenses so to avoid going into debt. And step 7. Look ahead. Having a stable budget can take a month or two so. Ask for help if things are not getting well. Wala ka namang pera? Kakagastos dito. Online shopping doon. Bili ng bili ng gamit kahit hindi naman kailangan. Makeup dito. Skincare doon. Milk tea dito. Samgyup doon. Tapos wala nang laman ng wallet mo. Tapos tamad ka pang damon nyo ka. Higa dito. Hilata doon. Babangon lang pagkakain na. 
Pati pagligo, nakalimutan mo na? At piling mo, 20 ka na pero wala ka pa rin silbe? Subukan maging madiskarte. Sa pamamagitan ng pagiging madiskarte, nadaragdagan ang pakinabang mo ng 50%. At bukod pa dyan, hindi ka na itatakwil ng pamilya mo. Kumilos ka dito, kumilos ka doon. Gamitin ang kamay at paali, chika. Gamitin din ang utak kung meron pa. Maaari rin mangutang kung kinakailangan, pero mangutang ng tama. Maging hashtag madiskarteng Pinoy with discartech. Dahil safe na mag-loan. At may loan na for drivers, doctors, negosyante, and etc. <laughs> Piliin maging madiskarte at magkaroon ng silbe. Dahil kung ayaw mo, ano bang hinihintay mo? Lumayas ka na, hindut ka. Let's talk about spending. If budget goals serve as a financial wish list, a spending plan is a way to make those wishes a reality. Turn them into an action plan. The following are practical strategies in setting and prioritizing budget goals and spending plan. Number one. Start by listing your goals. Setting budget goals require forecasting and discussing future needs and dreams with the family. Number two, divide your goals according to how long it will take to meet each goal. Classify your budget goals into three categories. First category, short-term category or less than a year. These are immediate needs and wants. Letter B, medium-term goals, one to five years. These are the things that you and your family wants to achieve. And letter C, your long-term goals, more than five years. These are the things in future such as planning for retirement and insurances and pension. Number 3. Estimate the cost of each goal and find out how much it costs. Before assigning priority to goals, it is important to determine the cost of each goal. The greater the cost of a goal, the more alternative goals must be sacrificed in order to achieve it. Number 4. Project Future Cost For short-term goals, inflation is not a big factor. But for medium and long-term goals, it is a big factor. To calculate the future of the goals, there is a need to determine the rate of inflation applied to each particular goal. Number 5. Calculate how much you need to set aside each period. Upon knowing the future cost of the goals, next is to determine how much to put aside each period to meet all the goals. Number 6. You prioritize your goals. Upon listing down all the goals and the estimated amount needed for each goal, prioritize them. These serve as guide in decision making. And number 7. Create a schedule for meeting your goals. It is important to lay down all the goals according to priority with the corresponding amount of money needed and all the installments needed to make your goals. Hello everyone! Thank you so much for coming to help us conduct this experiment today. We were of different ages. We were made to like stand in a line. Now I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. If your answer is a yes, step forward. If it's a no, please step back. Here goes. Ready? Did you learn how to ride a bicycle before the age of 10? Did you learn music in school? Did you take any lessons in sports? 
And no, video games are not a sport, even if it has the word game in it. Did you learn how to iron your clothes while still in school? Take a step forward, if not, take a step back. If you can make tea or breakfast, not just for yourselves, please step forward, if not, take a step back. In the beginning, I think the questions were more general. People were still going forward and backward uh, questions. Like it was funny to see, like uh, the cooking question. There were a lot of men who went ahead, and there were women who were going behind. Do you usually make all the household bill payments yourself? Do you know the circle rate in your area? Do you know the price of gold today? Do you know the exact breakup of your salary? As the questions unfolded, the stark difference came out visibly. Do you know the details of the financial documents you're asked to sign? Have you bought a vehicle in your own name without consulting anybody? Have you bought insurance policies unassisted? Do you watch or follow the budget? Like you think you're doing okay, but then you're like, okay, these are kind of important things that I don't look at. Do you manage your own finances and earnings unassisted? Do you know how to invest in mutual funds? Do you know the difference between a mutual fund and an SIP? Do you make the investments for your family members or your spouse? Do you file your own income tax return? Now everyone who's in front, could you please turn around and look behind you? Initially, when you guys started moving, there wasn't such a big gap. My question is, when did this gap start to occur? The minute the questions became about managing money, the gap between men and women became very clear and evident. You know, women handling certain responsibilities regarding their own life, which were always passed on to someone else in the family or the men. There was a slight unfairness, I realized at that time. But at that point, it, it seemed normal. I was upset. <laughs> I wanted to be at the front of the line. It's like, why don't I know this? Why am I not confident enough to say, yes, I am able to understand this? It was quite an eye-opener for me because I always depended on the men of the family to take care of my investments and, you know, plan my future. I felt that obviously men are more into it than uh, women. So eventually, I, I didn't expect the gap to be there. Over the years growing up, you know, there was there were certain very traditionally masculine tropes that were assigned for him and certain traditionally feminine tropes that were assigned for me. For women, it's practically debarred to learn to know and to focus on money. I wish I had known from the beginning of my childhood and I kind of thought about that I would be doing so much better. Just actionable measures is what we want, really. <laughs> Financial literacy is important because it allows an individual to understand and maximize whatever level of income they earn. It helps people transform their lives. So right now, let us talk about investing, investment, and savings. The choices made from among complex financial instruments with large range of options can impact a consumer's ability to buy a car, a home, finance and education, or save for retirement, adding to the decision-making pressure. Then too, the number of institutions offering products and services can be daunting. Like for example, banks, credit unions, insurance firms, credit card companies, brokerage firms, mortgage companies, financial planners, and other financial service companies are all vying for assets, creating confusion for the consumers. Let's talk about savings. In order to get out of debt, it is really important to set some money aside and put it into savings account on a regular basis. Savings will also help in buying things that are needed or wanted without borrowing money to other people. So now, let's talk about emergency savings fund. Start as early as possible. Setting aside a little money for emergency savings fund is really important. If you receive a bonus from work, an income tax refund or earnings from additional or side jobs, 
use them as an emergency fund. Before we listen to my special guest, I want you to know what are the 10 reasons why save money. So with credit so easy to get, here are 10 practical reasons why it is important to save money that everyone, including teachers and students, must know. So number one, to become financially independent. Financial independence is not having to depend on receiving a certain pay, but setting aside an amount to have savings that can be relied on. Number two, to save everything you buy. You know, being thrifty is one of the most important things also to have savings. So with savings, you can buy things when they are on sale and can make better spending choices without being compromised on credit card interest charges. Number three, to buy a home or a car. Savings can be used in buying a home in full of down payment, especially in times of promo deals, bids, and inevitable sale and at a reasonable interest rate. That's awesome! Let's proceed on number four. To prepare for the future. Through savings, you can be very futuristic or you can be very confident to face the future without worrying on how you will survive. Number five to get out of debt. If you want to get out of debt, you have to save money. Number six, to augment annual expenses. In order to attain good and stress-free financial life, there is a need to save for annual expenses in advance. Let's go to number seven, to settle unforeseen expenses. Savings can respond to unforeseen expenses in times of need. Number eight, to respond to emergencies. Emergencies may happen anytime and it's very inevitable. It may happen like one second at a time. So this can be very expensive. So there is a need to get prepared rather than potentially become another victim of an emergency. Number nine, to mitigate losing your job or getting hurt. Bad things can happen to anyone such as losing job, business, bankruptcy, or crisis, being injured, or becoming too sick to work. Therefore, having savings is the key to resolve such a dilemma. Lastly, number 10, to have a good life. Putting aside some money to spend when needed can bring out quality and worry-free life at all times. This is the most awaited part, so let's all continue learning about investing, investments, and savings. So let's hear from my guest speaker this morning. She graduated Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Information Technology in Asia Pacific College in 2003, worked at Globe Telecom as Account Management Specialist for seven years, Worked at IBM Singapore as admin assistant for four years. Owner of Laundry Box Rojas in Dao Branch. Owner of Caltex Water Refilling Station in Dao Capiz. Owner of Dao Gasoline Station in Sapi and Capiz. Joined Rotary Club of Rojas City last 2008. And recently, 2021 president of JCI Rojas Makawili and started investing at the age of 23. Let us all lend our ears to Mrs. Joanne Bermejo Adonai. Hi, good morning. I am Joanne Bermejo Adonai, owner of Laundry Box and Dao Gasoline Station. Now, let us talk about investing. Investing is using your money in a way that you can expect to earn extra income. It is like putting your hard-earned cash into work with the hope that you reap the returns later. Thus, investing involves two things. The risk that you take when you commit money to an investment and the potential return that is expected in exchange for taking that risk. Risks are part of investing. They can never be avoided. Knowing this fact should not stop you from looking into any opportunity that comes your way. Rather, it should motivate you to learn about them and the ways to manage them. Usually, young investors have high proportion of equity 
in their portfolio as their risk-taking capacity is more. Older people who are close to their retirement age should not invest in equity but should look for fixed income instruments such as bonds, mutual funds, and government securities as they would have provide a steady stream of cash flows with least possible risk. Don't go into investing for the sake of it. Put in a financial plan. You have to know why you're doing it, for how long, and what you're expecting to get out from it. As you're drawing up your financial plan, it is important that you understand how each of your goal would cost and how long you're planning to attain them. This combination of cost and timeline puts your plan into action. So your next concern would be how much capital you're going to put up for your goals. Some recommendations uh, would split your income to 50, 30, 20, where 50% is for your needs, 30% for your wants, and 20% for your savings, where you can get your capital. Or you can also follow the 70, 20, 10 rule, where 70% for your needs, and wants 20% for your savings and the remaining 10% for tithes and charity. And it is fairly easy to compute how much growth or rate of return if you have already determined the cost of your financial goal, the length of time you want to achieve it, and the capital that you're willing to commit. So for example, you want to buy a car worth a half a million pesos in five years, and you have 250 pesos 250,000 pesos right now. Then you'd need to look for an investment which can consistently deliver 10.67% growth per year. So for me now, I follow the pizza pie rule. I divide my wealth into 25% tranches, which composed of 25% cash, 25% in stocks, cryptocurrencies, commodities, forex, mutual funds, UITF, BUL, 25% in property, and 25% in my business or professional career. I allocate my assets this way to create a long-term wealth. My cash earns nothing and it's for emergencies. Philippine stocks, US stocks, cryptocurrencies, um, commodities, forex, mutual funds, UITF, BUL, investing gives me long-term return by actively tracking but passively holding. Properties give me passive income through rentals and my business gives me monthly income. And lastly, it is important that you do your due diligence so you can avoid investment scams. Know the details of an investment option that you, you are interested in, where it's an investment fund, a business franchise, or savings program. As Warren Buffett says, and I quote, if you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. And when investing, do not put all eggs in one basket. So to end, I'll share to you this common investing saying, the best time to invest was yesterday. The next best time is today. And the worst time is tomorrow. If you feel you're missing out on the gains yesterday or regretting that you should have invested earlier, don't fret out as the second best time is to invest today. No matter what your age is, you can start making your money work for you and become rich in time with compound interest. Again, thank you very much and good morning. Thank you, Press John. The bottom line is, any improvement in financial literacy will have a profound impact on consumers and their ability to provide for their future. Recent trends are making it all more imperative that consumers understand basic finances because they are being asked to shoulder more of the burden of investment decisions in their retirement accounts, all while having to decipher more complex financial products and options. Lastly, becoming a financial literate person, it is not very easy. But once it's mastered, it can ease life's burdens tremendously. Hello, welcome to our short discussion for today. I am John Hill Dorado, and right now I will introduce to you common financial scams to avoid. Financial fraud can happen to anyone, including the teachers, at any time. 
while some forms of financial fraud, such as massive data breaches, are out of one's control, there are many ways to proactively get rid of financial scams and identity theft. Here are some of the most common financial scams, along with ways to identify them early and how to protect oneself from being victimized. Phishing Using this common tactic, scammers send an email that appears to come from a financial institution, such as a bank, and ask you to click on a link to update your account information. If you receive any correspondence that asks for your information, never click on the links or provide account details. Instead, visit the company's website, find official contact information, and call them to verify the request. Social Media Scams Scammers are adept at using social media to gather information about the traveling habits of potential victims. They also have phishing tactics, including posts seeking charity donations with bubbles links that allow them to keep your money. Therefore, be conscious of the information you post online, especially personal details and plans for a vacation that you would leave your house unoccupied. Phone Scams Another prevalent tactic is scamming phone calls. The scammers pose as a government agency such as the Bureau of Internal Revenue or local law enforcement agencies and use scary tactics to acquire your personal information and account numbers. Never provide your account information over the phone. Look for the agency's contact information and call them to verify any requests. To note, government agencies will never text or call you to ask for money. Stolen Credit Card Numbers There are numerous ways that scammers can obtain your credit card information, including hacking, phishing, and the use of skimming devices, such as small card readers attached to unmanned credit card readers, examples ATMs, gas pumps, and more. These small devices pull data from your card when you swipe it. Before you use an ATM or swipe your card, look for suspicious devices that may be attached to the Identity theft. Depending on the amount of information a scammer is able to obtain, identity theft may extend beyond unauthorized charges in a debit or credit card. If scammers are able to obtain your social security number, date of birth, and other personal information, they may be able to open new accounts in your name without your knowledge. Be aware of an information you share and with whom, and always shred sensitive information before disposing it. By taking preventative measures and being aware of scams, you can minimize the risk of fraud. Monitoring your online or mobile banking accounts daily can also help you see fraudulent charges quickly. This has been John Neil Dorado, and those are the common financial scams to avoid. Hello guys, this is John Hill Dorado and I will introduce you 10 tips on how to avoid the common financial scams. Every year, fraud cases are getting worse, leaving countless victims in trouble and danger through data breaches, identity theft, and online scams. Unfortunately, new and improved technology only gives fraudsters an edge making it easier than ever for scam artists to nab financial data from unsuspecting consumers. First, never wire money to a stranger. Although it is one of the oldest internet scams, there are still consumers who fall for this rip-off or some variation of it. Number two. Then, don't give out financial information. Never reveal sensitive personal financial information to a person or business you don't know through phone, text, or email. Next, never click on hyperlinks in emails. If you receive an email from a stranger or company asking you to click on a hyperlink or open an attachment and then enter your financial information, delete the email immediately.
then use a difficult passwords. Hackers can easily find passwords that are simple number combinations. Create passwords that are at least 8 characters long and that includes some lower and uppercase letters, numbers and special characters. You should also use a different password for every website you visit. Next, never give your social security number. If you receive an email or visit a website that asks for your social security number, ignore it. Install antivirus and spyware protection. Protect the sensitive information stored in your computer by installing antivirus, firewall, and spyware protection. Once you install the program, turn on the auto-updating feature to make sure the software is always up to date. Next, don't shop with the unfamiliar online retailers. When it comes to online shopping, only do business with familiar companies. When purchasing a product from an unfamiliar retailer, do some research to ensure the business is legit and reputable. Don't download software from pop-up windows. When you're online, do not trust pop-up windows that appear to claim your computer isn't safe. If you click on the link in the pop-up to start the system scan or some other programs, malicious software known as malware could damage your operating system. Make sure the websites you visit are safe. Before you enter your financial information on any website, double-check the website's privacy rules. Also, make sure the website uses encryption, which is usually symbolized via locks to the left of the web address, which means it is safe and protected against hackers. And last, donate to known charities only. If you receive a call or an email for solicitation of charity donations, Critically examine it. Some scammers create bogus charities to steal credit card information. Again, and those are the 10 tips on how to avoid common financial scams. This is John Hill Dorado. Thank you for watching. Financial scams among students. Students can also be susceptible to different financial scams and fraud. Learning how to manage finances and being aware of financial scams are skills that every student should master. The following are common financial scams that students should watch out for, and learn to protect one's identity and finances. Fake scholarships. While it is beneficial for students to apply for as many scholarships, it is important to become aware of related scams and frauds. Students should thoroughly check scholarship sources before applying to verify legitimacy. Never apply for a scholarship that asks for money in return. Diploma bills. There are schools that offer fake degrees and diplomas in exchange for a fee. Check from government education agencies the prospective school to enroll in if it is government recognized, legitimate or accredited. Online book scams. While students often go for the best deals on textbooks online, scammers can use this opportunity to get students credit card information. When buying anything online, be sure to sew it on a credible site. Credit card scams Oftentimes, credit cards company go to school campuses to convince students to fill out card applications. Scammers may also grab this chance to steal students' information. It is important to visit a local credit union or bank for credit card application. Also, regularly check the credit card statement and once there are any unrecognized charges, contact your banking institution immediately. Insurance and Taxes What comes into your mind when you hear the word insurance? Insurance is a contract between the policyholder and the insurance company, whereby the company agrees to compensate for any financial loss from specific insured events. In exchange for the financial protection offered, policyholder agrees to pay a certain sum of money known as premiums to the insurance company. Insurance is the best form of risk management against uncertain loss. An entity which provides insurance is known as insurer, insurance company, or insurance carrier. A person or entity who buys insurance is known as an insured or policy holder. 
The insurance transaction involves the insured assuming a guaranteed and known relatively small loss in the form of payment to the insurer in exchange for the insurer's promise to compensate the insured in the event of a covered loss. The loss may or may not be financial, but it must be reducible to financial terms and must involve something in which the insured has an insurable interest established by ownership, passion, or pre-existing relationship. The insured receives a contract called insurance policy, which details the conditions and circumstances under which the insured will be financially compensated. There are various types of insurance to choose from, such as life insurance, health insurance, mother insurance, property insurance, business insurance, and many more. Besides, the financial protection derived from insurance entails tax benefit claim on the paid premiums. The following are concepts related to insurance and taxes that every teacher should know. First is the employer-sponsored insurance. If you are working in a company with 50 or more full-time employees, the employer is required to provide employee-only insurance that meets the minimum guidelines. If I have life insurance through my employer, am I adequately covered? So you got a job with benefits. Sounds great, right? Health, dental, vision, oh, and life insurance. Only hitch is that work-provided life insurance is usually not enough coverage if you have people who rely on you financially. These policies typically cover only one to two times your income when the average family needs about five to 10 times. Here's the deal. Life insurance from your employer is definitely a benefit, but it's temporary. When your employment ends, so does your coverage. If you decide to buy a policy then, it'll cost you more. You'll likely be a bit older and maybe a little less healthy. Better to get it from the start. And even though the odds of you walking out on your last day and being hit by an asteroid aren't very high, life insurance should go where you go. It's just that simple. Second is the marketplace plans. Marketplace plans are available based on an area of residence and income upon meeting minimum coverage requirement. The goal of the marketplace was to offer people who did not have access to employer-based plans an option that would provide tax credits and subsidies to help offset the costs of care. It put into place certain consumer rights, like being able to access health insurance even if you have a pre-existing condition and eliminating annual limits of health insurance coverage. To create health insurance options on the marketplace for consumers, four levels of plans were developed. Bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. These metal plans were designed to standardize the cost sharing between consumers and health insurance companies. It is based on the average amount each would pay for the plan. The chart beside me shows how the cost of care is shared between the consumer and the health insurance company. Let's look at the silver plan. What this means is that on average, a consumer will be covering 30% of the cost of care and the health insurance company will be covering 70%. As the percentage of the cost goes up for the health insurance company, typically the cost of the premium goes up for the consumer. The health insurance marketplace offers tax credits and subsidies for individuals or families who choose the silver plan. How much assistance you get depends on your income and family size. Understanding the marketplace plans can help you get insurance so you can access care and keep costs down. Be sure to consider your health care needs when you are choosing a plan and regardless of which plan you pick, set money aside to cover out-of-pocket health care costs in a savings account so that you can access care when you need it most. Life insurance is a type of insurance that compensate beneficiaries upon the death of the policyholder. The company will guarantee a payout for the beneficiaries in exchange of premiums. This compensation is called death benefit. The following are common risk categories. First is the preferred plus. The policy holder is in excellent health with normal weight, no history of smoking, chronic illnesses, or family history of any life-threatening disease. Second is the preferred. The policy holder is in excellent health but may have minor issues on cholesterol or blood pressure but under control. 
third is a standard loss. The policy holder is in very good health but some factors like high blood pressure or being overweight impede a better rating. Fourth is a standard. Most policy holders belong to this category as they are deemed to be healthy and have a normal life expectancy although they may have a family history of life-threatening diseases or few minor health issues. The fifth one is the substandard. Those with serious health issues like diabetes or heart disease are placed on a table rating system ranked from highest to lowest. On average, the premiums will be similar to standard with an additional 25% lower claim on table ratings. The last one is the smokers. Due to an added risk of smoking, the policy holders in this category are guaranteed to pay more. Aside from health class, age is also a critical factor in determining premiums. Therefore, older people pay more expensive premiums. Here are the benefits of life insurance. It pays for medical and funeral costs. Life insurance helps solve the incurred expenses for medical and funeral services to lessen the grief among family and relatives for being unprepared. For financial support, life insurance can become a source of temporary income during the difficult period of adjusting and coping with the loss of a loved one, especially if he or she is the breadwinner. For funding various financial goals, life insurance offers additional benefits through the form of fund accumulation for specific future financial goals. It also acts as a retirement security confirm. Modern life insurance also serves a tool that principal holders can use to get in a better financial position in the future. Lastly, it covers costs incurred from taxes and debt. Life insurance can serve as protection since the premium can be used to pay for unsettled debts and taxes. Here are the types of life insurance. First is the endowment. It grants a lump sum after a specified amount of time or upon death. The policy owner is required to pay the premium for a predetermined number of years or until a specific age is reached. Second is the term. It is the simplest form of life insurance to obtain, of which upon death, the beneficiaries are paid with the benefit. Third is whole life. It provides coverage for the policyholders' entire life or until they reach 100 years old. It acts both as protection and savings mechanisms since a portion of the premium is allocated to build up cash values. The last one is the Variable Universal Life or VUL. It serves as both life protection and investment vehicle in one package. A portion of the premium is allocated into various investment vehicles for the purposes of wealth creation. The contract's earnings are based on the performance of selected investments. Here are the advantages and disadvantages of the four types of life insurance. In the endowment, the advantages are the following. It allows for saving up for specific purposes. It guarantees returns upon maturity and it offers some form of insurance coverage. The disadvantages are the following. It requires higher premiums than other types of life insurance and it is not the best option for those looking at full life protection. In term, the advantages are the following. It entails low premium requirements. It is a strong option for policyholders who need insurance but cannot afford whole life or endowment and it is easy to understand. The disadvantages are the following. It has no benefit if policyholders outlives the term period set and the premium usually gets higher upon renewal of terms. In whole life, the advantages are the following. It offers permanent protection for full life or 100 years. It is flexible in terms of payments of premiums. It entails fixed premiums and it usually comes with additional features and living 
benefits. The disadvantages are the following. It requires higher premiums and it is difficult to understand due to complexity. In Variable Universal Life or VUL, the advantages are the following. It takes dual purpose, life insurance plus investment tool. It has no maturity age. The cash value is payable along with the assured sum. The debt component is not limited to face value. It depicts liquidity wherein funds can be accessed in times of need and can serve as emergency funds. The disadvantages are the following. Cash values and dividends are not guaranteed. Face amount and debt benefit are dependent on investment performance and it includes various investment fees. Shopping for life insurance can be confusing if you were not familiar with the terms and it is not the easiest thing to do even if you are familiar with the lingo. A life insurance agent should be able to explain policies and terms to you in an understandable fashion and help you to explore your options. Here are five of the most important questions to pose to your agent. 1. How stable is the insurer? If you are buying from an independent agent or broker, you may not realize who the actual insurer is or you may not know much about the company. Many well-respected insurance companies are not household names. Your agent should be able to give you details about your insuring company, including the size, assets, financial stability, ratings with AM Best or other industry rating systems, proof of license to operate in your state, and any other questions you may have. 2. How much life insurance do you need? Most insurers will have a formula to determine your expected need based on two factors, how much it will take to pay off all of your debts including your mortgage and the lifestyle that your dependents expect to live after you are gone. However, this formula differs between insurers. Your agent should be able to explain the methodology to you and how to value properly any unusual needs you may have such as medical debts, business obligations or other debt that may not be covered in a standard formula. 3. What type of insurance is best for you? Do you need simple term life insurance or do you find the investment component of a permanent life policy attractive? A good agent should be able to follow up with questions such as your tolerance for risk, investing acumen, affordability of a policy given your income, and other factors to determine what is best in your case. If an agent cannot explain the purpose and terms of each type of policy in a way that you can understand, beware. They either do not understand it themselves or cannot communicate it properly. In either case, you can do better. 4. What are the exclusions and benefits? Any policy will contain exclusions in the fine print as well as an explanation of the benefits. It is important to understand both in detail. For example, does your death benefit adjust for inflation? Is there a premium waiver in case of disability? And what is the definition of disability? Is death through dangerous hobbies like skydiving excluded? Is that important to you? 5. Is the policy renewable and or convertible? If you have a term policy, what are your options to renew it at the end of the term? Does it require a new medical exam and a premium increase? Can you convert the policy into a permanent policy and how much will it cost? The ability to convert to a permanent policy at the right time is extremely useful. As you age, with most renewable policies the premiums for a term policy will surpass those of a permanent policy. Make sure you understand your options to maximize your value and minimize your premiums. A good insurance agent will be able to provide you with straight answers to these questions and help find the best policies for you. Find an insurance agent you can trust and pose these questions to him or her. However, you should trust your instincts. If something does not seem right, find a different agent and insurer. Be confident before you've signed any insurance policy and read the fine print. Make sure you're getting what you're paying for. Oh, hi. Ahoy there. Um, don't mind me coming out from the comfort room, but don't worry. Um, I'm cleaning. 
So, by the way, I'm Divine and I'm going to talk about financial stability. You know, like everyone else in this world, teachers wants to become financially stable. Maybe not now, maybe in the future. So, being financially stable means that you are confident with your financial situations. You are worrying less in paying your bills because of your available funds. You're debt free and of course you have money savings for your future goals. And of course you have enough emergency funds. Well, I'm going to present to you the 10 strategies in reaching financial stability from Baba Uta of 2007. So number one, make sure that your savings is automatical which means that your savings should be in a priority list. To save money means you ensure security in your life and gain greater sense of financial freedom. Automatic savings refers to a typical structure of an automatic transfer from an individual's bank account into savings or investments. In this case, you are paying yourself first and literally you'll be paying your savings account at the same time that you get paid by your employer. Number two, control your impulsive spending. Impulsive spending like you're spending too much on your average budget. Like going out with friends, going to cine, you know, eating too much, sangyu. You know, you have to remember that your money is very valuable and you should spend it wisely. Three, evaluate your expenses and live frugally. So here is you have to analyze all your spending. Uh, it means that you can analyze what things to buy, and of course you have to seek for alternatives that are way cheaper but have the same value. So number four, invest in your future. You have to start preparing and investing for your future retirement while you're still young. You can invest in different stock markets, maybe in the Philippine stock market. If you're available and if you're interested. Number five, keep your family secure. In this time, you have money. Now you have to make sure you have enough emergency funds. Because in case of emergency in your family, you know where you're gonna get your money. Number six, eliminate and avoid debts. This means that you have to eliminate your credit cards, personal loans, and any form of debt. Just like 5-6. You have to avoid that, especially if you don't have any money to pay it off. It could pull you down, bro. Number 7. Use the envelope system. In this envelope system, you are going to set aside the three amounts in your budget in each payday. Withdraw them and put it in the three separate envelopes. In that way, you can easily track the remaining money from your expenses. Hi, let's say you have 10,000 pesos. These money are intended to help you in your expenses. Let's say you have these categories, your rent, allowance, food, and electricity. To use the envelope system, you have to allocate the specific amount of money for each category of your expenses that I wish we should have known sooner. Pay your bills immediately. One good habit of a person is paying their bills as soon as they come in and try to get your bills to be paid through an automatic deduction. Number nine, read about personal finances, such as The Automatic Millionaire by David Back. This is too because the more you educate yourself, the better your finances will be. Of course, you can also um, read about the, any economic books and of course you can also um, go to any expert or people who are good in finances and they are really successful in it so you can get some ideas number 10 look to grow your network do whatever you can to improve your network um, either by reducing your debt Increasing your savings or increasing your income or maybe all of the above Signs of being financially stable 
Teachers, like anyone else, often work to the extent to earn more even through additional jobs on the side just for their desire for financial stability. Now, it's time for our not-so-flash interview with teachers from Sapien National High School. Let's check if they have the signs of financial stability. Hey, why don't you try to answer the questions that we are about to ask them too? It will be cool. Uh, good morning. Uh, may I know your name? Uh, I am Lodity of Bellingham. Um, what is your job? I am a teacher. Okay, awesome. Can I ask you some questions? Of course. Okay. Do you consider yourself financially stable? No. Okay. Now I will present you some questions. These are signs of being financially stable person. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Number one, you never overdrew your checking account? Yes. Do you lose some sleep because of finances? No. Do you have a credit card? Yes. Do you use it for convenience and rewards but never out of necessity? No. Do you worry about your job? Of course. Do you pay your bills ahead of time? No. Okay. Um, do you ask for your opinion? Uh, do people ask for your opinion about financial situations? Sometimes. Have you ever finance your cars over five years or less if you take loans at all? Yes. Do you contribute more to your retirement? No. Do you feel guilt when you're out for special occasions? Of course. Okay, ma'am. So, what advice advice can you give to us to reach our potential in finance? Uh, let us try to manage our finances by once in a while check, checking it out as to what are our needs and our requirements. Okay. Thank you very much, Mom, and God bless. Good morning, sir. Good morning. May I know your name? I'm Mr. Chris Marco Alido. Okay. What is your job, sir? I'm a teacher. Okay. Can I ask you some questions? Yes, of course. Okay. Do you consider yourself financially stable? No. Okay. Now I will present some questions. These are signs of being a financially stable person. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Number one. Can you afford to buy the things you really want? Uh, not all the things that I want. Okay. Um, do you do rec recreational spending appeal to you? No. Are you a natural saver? Yes. Are you generous with money when it comes to charities and helping others? Sometimes. Okay. Are you confident about your future? Yes. Your network grows significantly from year to year? Yes. Do you have substantial equity in your home? Yes. Do you consistently live beneath your means? Beneath your means? Uh, yes. Okay. Can you survive for months without paycheck? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, number 20, are you in control of your finances and never dominated by them? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, here, you can explain or you can give your insights. What secrets can you share to us that can help us find stability in finance? Uh, in my case, I save a lot and I prefer buying those needs than the things that I want. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, sir, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. The questions or signs are like checklists. It do not ask or check when did you accomplish a single task, but rather ensures that you are reaching stability in finance one step at a time. Integrating Financial Literacy into the Curriculum Financial education in schools should be part of a collaborative national strategy to ensure relevance in long-term sustainability. The education system and profession should be involved in the development of the strategy. In support, Barry of 2013 underscored that financial literacy has a wide repercussion outside the family circle and more precisely, the school. Hence, administrators and professors need to develop a curriculum that would provide students insight in having the value of financial literacy including the effects it can bring them. Moreover, there should be a learning framework which sets out goals, learning outcomes, content, pedagogical approaches, 
resources, and evaluation plans. The content should cover knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values. A sustainable resource of funding should be identified at the outset. Financial education should ideally be a core part of the school curriculum. It can be integrated into other subjects like mathematics, economics, social studies, technology, and home economics, values education, and others. Financial education can give a range of real-life contexts across the range of subjects. Teachers should be adequately trained and resourced made aware of the importance of financial literacy and relevant pedagogical methods and they should receive continuous support to teach it or integrate in their lessons. More so, there should be easily accessible, objective, high-quality and effective learning tools and pedagogical resources available to the schools and teachers that are appropriate to the level of the study. Students' progress should be assessed through various high-impact modes.